The book of Joshua is a hot mess. If you read Joshua and compare it to the book of Judges, you will quickly realize that there are irreconcilable contradictions. Today we're going to look at just one incident in the book of Joshua, and that is the conquest of Jerusalem. Joshua chapter 10 gives the account of Adonai's deck king of Jerusalem, and how he conspires with five other kings to resist Joshua and the children of Israel. In verse 8, God tells Joshua not to worry about the five kings, because he's going to give Joshua a victory. Verse 13 tells us that the sun stood still during the battle. And verse 20 tells that Joshua and the children of Israel, quote, had made an end of slain of them with a very great slaughter until they were consumed. Verse 26, Joshua slays the king of Jerusalem. And the rest of the chapter tells how Joshua continued to smote and slaughter until finally in verse 40, the victory is complete. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs and all the kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed. As the Lord God of Israel commanded. Chapter 12 verse 7 tells us that Joshua divided up the land of Israel amongst the tribes of Israel and verse 10 includes Jerusalem. Chapter 10 and chapter 12 strongly imply that Joshua took the city of Jerusalem and murdered everyone within. However, we read in Joshua 15 verse 63 that, as for the Jebusites and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Israel could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah uh, at Jerusalem to this day. Maybe the term utterly destroyed all that breathed means that Joshua only killed some people in Jerusalem. Or maybe the Jebusites were a unique race of people who did not breathe. Maybe the Jebusites lived in the suburbs of Jerusalem. I will withhold judgment on this seeming contradiction for now because maybe I need to get more context. Whatever the term utterly destroyed all that breathed means, you would be intellectually dishonest if you did not admit that Joshua 10 definitively states that at least some act of violence was committed against the inhabitants of Jerusalem by Joshua and the children of Israel under his command. This, however, plainly contradicts the book of Judges which states in Judges 1.1, 1, 1, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who will go up against the Canaanites first to fight against them? But wait, I thought Joshua already conquered the land, and the Canaanites were specifically mentioned as being slaughtered in Joshua chapter 11, verse 3. And the Canaanites and Jebusites are specifically mentioned in the order of battle, in Joshua chapter 11, verse 8, quote, The Lord delivered them unto the hand of Israel. Verse 11 tells us that, quote, They smote all the souls that were within the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe. And verse 12 tells us, quote, All the cities of those kings and all the kings to them did Joshua take and smote at the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed them. But let's get back to Jerusalem. Judges 1 verse 8 says that now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. But wait, Judges 1 verse 21 tells me, and the children of Benjamin did not drive out the inhabitants or did not drive out the Jebusites and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. This makes no sense to me. Did Judah take Jerusalem or not? So the Benjamites and the Jebusites live in a city that has been burnt down. Did Joshua utterly destroy all that breathed, which included the Canaanites and Jebusites in Joshua chapter 11, verse three? And didn't God say that he delivered the Canaanites and the Jebusites to Joshua in uh, chapter 24, verse 11. So who owns the city of Jerusalem after the book of Judges? 
Well, it appears that Israel owns the city of Jerusalem because David takes the head of Goliath there as a trophy in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 54. But then, why does David have to conquer Jerusalem in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5, verse 6? The story tells us how King David wrests control from the city from the Jebusites. But I thought the Jebusites were slaughtered by Judah in Judges 1, verse 8. So let's assume that David did conquer the city of Jerusalem. How did he do it? Well, he apparently did it by sneaking into the city using the aqueducts. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6. They were built by Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 20. So you see, King David is able to use aqueducts that were built by his distant progeny. Amazing, isn't it? King David utilized an architectural feature that was built over 200 years after the time in which he lived. Well, maybe George Washington used airplanes to defeat the British at the Battle of Yorktown. The conquest of Jerusalem is but one example of several, where the book of Joshua completely contradicts other parts of the Old Testament. I could go on with contradictions in the book of Joshua, but to quote the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verse 25, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. So what's my theory? Well, my theory is that the book of Joshua is not even close to history. It was probably a propaganda piece to give the Jews confidence and courage. It probably was written at a later date, maybe when the Israelites were being attacked by the Chaldeans. If you want further proof that the book of Joshua is bunk, try looking at the work of archaeologist Catherine Kenyon, who indicated that the walls of Jericho had been burnt down some 300 years prior to the time of Joshua. Or ask yourself, what would happen to the earth if it stopped spinning such that it appeared that the sun halted in the sky? I'll give you a hint. It would have major geotectonic implications. Now, I can hear you, uh, your objection. But these can't be contradictions because they're too blatant. The Jewish clergy are not stupid. Why would they include such blatantly contradictory accounts? There must be another explanation. My response to that is that the Old Testament in ancient Israel was not a coherent collection of books. Gradually, as the religion evolved, various religious texts were collected and assembled. I believe that Joshua was written at a much later date and contains almost no historically accurate information. But maybe Joshua is not meant to be taken literally, and we're only to look at it in allegorical metaphor. Now, if that's true, then these are the moral lessons that you can take from the book of Joshua. God so loves the world, so long as you're Jewish. Aggressive war is okay, as long as it's holy war. It's okay to kill non-combatants, including women and children, so long as God tells you to do so. Joshua chapter 6, verse 21. When conducting holy war, it's okay to rape women, so long as you make them one of your plural wives. See Numbers uh, chapter thir uh, 31, verse 18. So do you think that the book of Joshua is inspired by God?